pause here. Is it live? Not yet. Hi. Please go ahead. Sakibha, you can go ahead. Hi, sorry. Are we live yet? It's recording. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Saqib Haq. I'm from the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD. Uh, thank you all for joining our session here today, which is the closing session for the South Asia Regional Resilience Hub that we've been doing for the last uh, several years now in collaboration with a number of our partners who I'll allude to in a minute. But I just wanted to give everybody a vote of thanks for joining us for this week, for a lot of the sessions that we've had. We had a number of very interesting discussions and a few trending topics that we've been tracking as climate resilience options that have been coming up in the South Asia regional um, countries. So what we've been trying to do over the series of these hubs over the last few years is to try and bring together not just people that are actively working in the climate space, but also practitioners that have good experiences in being able to tackle some of the climate actions that are happening in their localities, in their communities, in their districts, in their regions, and use this as a platform for everybody to learn regionally. Because we understand quite a lot of these things are very, very context specific, but similar contexts can happen in different countries. And it's not always the case that, you know, you can only learn from your own individual experiences, but there are other people that are also working on a number of different initiatives, and they're facing similar challenges, and there might be some lessons and learnings that we can take from that particularly ourselves, the ICAD, International Center for Climate Change and Development, we're a research and capacity building organization. So we really rely on these types of interactions, these types of platforms, working with the partners that we do that have hosted sessions this week for this year, but also for the years previous and hopefully the years to come, where we can learn about new trending topics that they're working on, things that perhaps at this point in time does not necessarily have a very good body of evidence in terms of research and collation of, of studies together, but are trends that we should be looking at and being able to align ourselves to be able to take more appropriate climate actions to come forward. So again, for ourselves, it's been very welcome to have everybody join us for this week and very very grateful that you all continued and for all the different participants and the speakers and the panelists and all everybody working behind the scenes my team included a very very big thank and a big clap for everybody for having pulled off a very successful week so with that being said i'd like to hand over to my colleague adiba just to give us an overview of what happened this week and then i'll call on some of our partners for some of their reflections going forward thank you so much adiba yes so for the uh, South Asian Resilience Hub, I'll just give a claims or a brief overview, like what we did uh, as this is a discussion based uh, closing ceremony. So I didn't prepare any presentation. I just want to have a discussion like what we did, how was the session, how was the week actually? It was a very busy week as we have received uh, six, almost 700 people have registered for the South Asian Resilience Hub. We weren't actually expecting this number. And for the inaugural session, the, in the opening session, 200 plus people actually tried to join the session. That's why our link, our uh, link got uh, actually, uh, there was some technical glitch started as 20, 200 people clicked the join link to, all together. That's why we had to go live and we had to share the live link with everyone, 200 of them. So it was a crowd that we weren't expecting. And as mentioned by my colleague Sakib, that this year we are actually hosting the South Asian Resilience Hub for the third time in partnership in support of GRP. So initially we had actually uh, three themes on this Resilience Hub. One is loss and damage, one is locally led adaptation, and one is climate and biodiversity. So we had number of application we received under three of these themes, which um, we had to actually then filter and then had to choose like uh, which we should actually host this year. And as I mentioned, it was a week-long event. We 
the hub was started at 9th September and this is the uh, today's the closing and this time we had the uh, we had an objective of like giving the opportunity to the frontliners we tried to mention in the application process like the frontliners who actually are the vulnerable the uh, uh, climate impacts who have directly the climate in her will get the chance to actually share their stories. Then prioritizing regional learning was one of our main objective. And then we had some practical resilience solutions that were actually in the center of the resilience hub. We actually um, wanted to keep in forward. And then lastly, in collaboration with other organizations, especially the local organizations, often their voices are not heard or being unheard so we try to actually keep their voice as well in the resilience hub so i'll just give you an overview like throughout the week we try mostly we had a couple of sessions uh in a day so the first day first show was on uh and most of this uh, session were mixed of loss and damage lla and climate and biodiversity the for, so for the first session that we had is on food security and solutions uh, like climate smart mapping where communities involved from bottom to up of the approach were discussed or suggested by ED International Rice Research Organization. And then the on the first day, second session was on heat wave. Heat is actually an important and emerging issue for South Asia. Earlier, even uh, uh, in before last two years, like it wasn't a topic of discussion, but now it is in the center of discussion. Like this year, we in the most some of the South Asian countries there were extreme heat alert actually going when on so for that the second session was on extreme heat wave and so some solution or suggestion like uh, happening in india like scalable climatic parametric insurance were actually suggested with cross subsidization um, in the session and then the second day it was on gender and nexus between women and renewable energy challenges like rural women suffered the most were actually discussed but then again the session also echoed strengthen and multi-stakeholder partnership to ensure gender responsible renewable energy solution were also um, uh, came uh, across from the discussion as a suggestion and the second session from first day, it was also on uh, second day, actually, second session, strengthening governance and scaling up, scaling up solution to accelerate implementation of locally led adaptation in South Asia. And uh, this session was hosted by UNDP and UNCDF. So uh, suggestions or discussion came from Bangladesh Logic Project. There is a project uh, that's implemented locally led an initiatives. And ECAD is also a partner in this project in the monitoring and evaluation of the activities, like how actually LLA been implemented and is there any success case of from this project. So such discussions from LLA project where uh, logic project were shown. Then again, Nepal uh, local initiative also showcased in this session from the session. Third day, it was a um, um, session where actually local voices were uh, brought up in this platform. They have shared, they have shared in their own language like Bangla about their initiative the community mangrove plantation initiative so we have translated that language into english uh, for everyone so uh, through this way actually we try to have the their voices in this platform and um, in this uh, mangrove plantation um, activities the we communities actually involved upon emphasizes communities from seed collection to monitoring ensuring that local and indigenous po population are active participants and beneficiaries in the conservation process so it also helps this mangrove plantation actually helps to ensure the community ownership which was actually um, uh, uh, not seen in the cba community based adaptation process but seen in the uh, locally led adaptation process so it was also ensured that community has the ownership and sustainable management of natural resources through seed um, um, sampling uh, distribution and then again the second session came to heat heat wave and heat how the marginalized pop 
population um, uh, are um, through enhancing heat resilience of the marginalized population, locally led adaptation ac actions. And uh, suggestions actually came up uh, like uh, collaboration and solidarity. And as you know that there are few uh, climate chief, chief heat officers in the world and Bangladesh uh, is lucky to get one climate chief or heat officer who actually are planning for the rickshaw pullers for of Bangladesh who have a broad plan like the climate action plan uh, climate heat action plan so he, she mentioned about their plan and how the government are actually going to um, uh, process with those plans things like that were actually discussed on the session and today was the last day and we before the this session, we had actually a session which actually uh, resonated um, discussion like a regenerative agriculture in South Asia so to bring in, in a sustainable way to reduce the burden on agricultures. So suggestions like solar irrigation palm utilization uh, were brought up in the session and uh, they are in the long run incorporating biodiversity conservation with agriculture is essential for climate mitigation and climate adaptation were also discussed in the session. So this was more or less the week, how the uh, discussion were started, where the discussion went. And um, as a um, summary, I can sh say that more most of the discussion actually come up in a point where they know the solution, they know the problem. What they are looking for is solidarity, more collaboration, more opportunities to scale up and more ways for partnership is the message they actually uh, provided throughout the uh, sessions, throughout the discussion. So with that, I would like to stop here, but I'd like to also mention two things that we are also hosting after this Resilience Hub, as we are closing this today, we are also hosting two virtual sessions on water and um, policy uh, discussion following the New York Climate Action Week uh, on next month, actually, in partnership with GRP and uh, other organizations. It will held on, it will be held on uh, 8, uh, 7th and 8 October next month. So uh, that's all. Maybe I will, what I will do is um, I will prepare a report from this discussion, the Resilience Hub discussion, to have more um, to actually take these messages to uh, maybe physical COP. I guess I will stop here and um, give the floor to Sakib, my colleague. Thank you, Adiba. And I think that was a very, very quick overview of a very, very long and intensive week that you and the team have had, as well as our partners that have been hosting the sessions and the participants that have followed almost all of them. I, I know that there is a small percentage, but we did have a, a successive percentage of people being able to attend most of the sessions. Um, so as we mentioned before, that there are, obviously, there are a number of um, activities and sessions and projects that many of us are working on. But to be able to find those synergies. What are the different ways that we're working on similar themes, on similar topics, on similar districts and regions and areas? What are the ways that we can bring together so that we can actually bring in the synergies, the collaborations, and build those partnerships to, to sustain in the longer run and be more impactful? So I think, as, as Adiba mentioned quite rightly, a lot of the discussions that have been coming through, of course, funding and financing for the appropriate areas, the initiatives that people are working on, that people are uh, researching and studying and implementing are extremely important but along with the financing is to be able to meet the other people that are working on these things developing those partnerships those long-term relationships as a community of practice as we hear in many of the different spheres working in the climate and development sectors having that community of practice is not just a keyword or a tag word that we take lightly from MICAD. It's something that we like to actually try and foster. What are the different ways that we can bring together people from all the different stakeholders and sectors and categories that we interact with under our programs, and then bring them together on a platform with other people that are doing similar work so that the, the, you can really understand how to cross fertilize the, the impact that people are having and bring that as, as a community together, rather than working in our individual silos, having minimal successes, small 
small progressive changes here and there, but something that really is beneficial and impactful that has a little bit more added value with everybody collaborating and working together. So thank you, Adiba, for giving us a an overview, but also giving us the concise, the key messages that have come through about fostering more partnerships and collaborations to go forward. So in that note, I'm delighted to jump into the partners that have joined us for the closing session here. Thank you all for joining from the various different time zones that you are, uh, perhaps a weekend at your end or not. But we really appreciate you coming in to give us some reflections and some words. So I'll hand over to a good friend of ours, Emil, Emil Harkishan. If you can maybe at the end of your remarks, hand back to me, Emil. The floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much, Saqib. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Emil Harikishan. I'm South African based here in Johannesburg. I work for an organization called South South North, and more specifically, I'm the finance thematic lead for a program called the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, or CDKN. Um, we lead the Africa Regional Resilience Hub, but are also managing partners along with Avena, ICAD, and Slum Dwellers International of the Resilience Hub. Uh, just to say as well, our colleagues from Slum Dwellers International also co-lead the Africa Regional Resilience Hub with us. It's certainly been an interesting year, um, I think particularly for the regional hubs and the resilience hub, as this is the fourth year in a row that we've done this. It's been a moment to also pause and reflect as Sakiba and Adiba have been mentioning in their opening remarks. And certainly I think uh, a COP that's poised for uh, potentially a lot of technical outcomes um, and then the buildup of course to Brazil as well. So hearing that this COP in Baku is going to be a finance COP and reflecting of course on finance as being critical for inclusive and transformative resilience building um, and certainly pertinent I'm sure as well uh, to South Asia and to Latin America and the Caribbean and the rest of the global south. So certainly for the Africa region hub and for many of the African voices that we've been engaging throughout the year, finance and resource mobilization coming out on top as being a key issue and certainly across scales for uh, African stakeholders. So looking at the new collective quantified goal on finance or NCQG, but also unpacking and understanding how we get finance to the uh, most appropriate local level and specifically to communities and lesser heard and underrepresented constituencies, primarily these highly climate affected communities that really need to be a part of the narrative. Um, and alongside that, I think we've been engaging a lot on youth voices in Africa. Um, and trying to take a African youth agenda that came out of an African youth conference uh, a few months ago in Morocco and trying to also amplify that as well. So really trying to bring in diverse voices, of course, that being a, a huge role that the regional hubs in general play, um, but really trying to see that from different angles. So bringing in youth um, as well as continuously trying to uh, broaden the understanding of the role of art, culture, heritage uh, in climate action as well. So really trying to find different opportunities to amplify that and specifically trying to amplify thought leadership from Africa in general. So, of course, when we summarize key messages, it's very easy to remove the people and organizations who actually have brought those ideas to the fore. Um, and so we've really tried last year in particular to really try and put people and organizations at the center of those key messages that were emerging. So really trying to deepen them um, a lot further. The last thing I'll say, and, and really interesting linkages, of course, with what was discussed uh, in South Asia this week, uh, heat stress, extreme heat stress in cities, also emerging as a key issue for Africa as well. Um, scalable parametric insurance, looking at loss and damage and understanding the DRR and humanitarian relief angle on that as well. Uh, strong elements, of course, on gender equity and social inclusion. And I mentioned indigenous peoples and lesser heard voices and constituencies as well. The last thing I'll mention, the last key point is around bringing together climate change and biodiversity as well. Um, so uh, a few of us are heading off to COP16 in uh, Colombia and really trying to bring together these different uh, conventions and seeing uh, um, resilience from these different perspectives and how we bring them together. So certainly going to be a, an interesting road towards Brazil next year as well, where we're hoping to really see biodiversity and climate and specifically on the finance aspects coming together. But so keep with that, let me just end and I'm happy to answer any questions and unpack any of this a bit further. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Emil. So maybe just picking up on some of the, the critical areas that you mentioned that, again, as I mentioned, that a lot of the different discussions we've been having over the week did really relate to the fact that, you know, financing is a constraint. In many cases, there are organizations and development NGOs that have been working for many years that have more or less been getting the same amount of funding, get do, struggling to do the same amount of impact year on year, not really being able to build up on that. Um, so maybe just a little bit of a, a question to you on how do we leverage these sorts of messages coming from partnerships? Because traditionally, a lot of the climate funding has been very, very restrictive to projects and programs, which doesn't really allow for a lot of collaboration and, and sort of partnerships and network building. But it is something that on the fringes of these COPs and in, again, in our, our sort of regional hubs, our CBA conferences, the community-based adaptation conferences, for those of you that follow that series as well, are, are something that we've been sort of highlighting and discussing on how do we foster that more, but then the funding support is more and more targeted and a bit more siloed. So again, what would be some of the lessons that we as a region really need to be bringing forward, showing that these partnerships need to be well-resourced, well-funded, and then what are some of the ways in these different conventions? As you mentioned, the climate is not the only one. There's the Convention on Biodiversity, there's the Land Desertification Convention, the Disaster Sendai Framework Conventions, and many other trade bodies and SDG conventions where these relevant conversations need to be happening. So how do we then leverage that? So maybe not put you on the spot, but a little bit of an open thinking from your end. Well, yeah, thanks, Saqib. Let's see if we can solve this problem in this closing session. I think maybe we can. Um, look, uh, within CDKN as a program, but South South North as well, we're really trying to unpack and understand across scales how we actually transform these funding landscapes and how these landscapes for, say, biodiversity finance, development finance, climate finance, et cetera, how these can actually interplay with one another to actually become more efficient and effective. And I'll quote something Andres actually said at an event at COP at the end of last year for an event I was moderating. Andres, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you said in the current climate finance landscape, we have needs that seek the resources. And actually, and this was particularly in reference and this to loss and damage finance, how do we shift that for the resources seeking the needs? And that really stuck with me Andres because I think it really uh, flips the question. Uh, and I think uh, it becomes beholden on those that are mobilizing the resources at global levels, et cetera, for say the major climate funds, but, but also for bilateral donors and philanthropy, et cetera, is to actually ask these hard questions. How do we seek the needs? Um, and we've had lots of discussions around innovative financial mechanisms and solutions, et cetera, but I think there are certain fundamental mindset shifts in ensuring that finance actually goes to where it matters most. And for many of us on this call uh, that are leading these regional hubs, we're saying to the most local level, we're strong advocates for locally led adaptation. And Adiba, I think, walked through some of the discussions that have been happening this week. And so we really need to be looking at uh, systems transformations and keeping in mind where we're trying to get the money to. And again, to Andres's point uh, at COP last year, how do we shift the narrative of the resources seeking the needs? Because at, uh, local communities are not going to be impressed at us celebrating huge amounts of money committed at COP, whether it's the this year or next year. And actually what they want to see is, is money moving. And that's how we'll know if we're successful, if we're actually seeing money reaching uh, uh, where we're saying it matters most and to the most climate affected communities. Thanks. Thank you, Emil. And then thank you also for the nice segue into Andres, who is also in my next of <laughs> list of speakers. So again, Andres, I'll, I'll hand over to you for your remarks at the end of it, if you could please hand it back to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saqib, and thank you very much, Amil, also. So allow me to introduce myself to everyone. My name is Andres Mogro. I work in Fundación Avina. I'm the regional manager of the climate program in Avina. Um, and together with ICAD and with South South North, we are managing partners of the Resilience Hub. So Avina has been very much involved and in charge of organizing everything related to the Resilience Hub in Latin America and the Caribbean. Very happy to hear, and of course, big congratulations mm -hmm. to ICAT for all the conversations that they've been organizing in, in the South Asia um, Resilience Hub, because many of these issues are in fact crucial to all of the Global South countries and, and all of the developing countries. Currently, um, and this last month, for instance, most of Latin America, including Brazil, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador, we've been suffering from gigantic forest fires because of the drought and the heat wave in, in Latin America. And that not, not only 
affects the biodiversity and the capacity of the region to 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 fulfill its role in in the absorption of of CO two emissions, but also in generating emissions coming from these forest fires. So we're very much concerned about that, and we've been trying very hard to to um, create awareness among so, some of the issues that climate change has is uh, it, it has been creating in in relation to forest fires and in relation to the impacts of 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 uh, of, of heat waves and, and and of lack of precipitation and lack of rain, particularly in the region, because we're suffering from a great drought. Um, the objectives that we've been pushing very much forward in, in the context of the conversations of the Resilience Hub in Latin America are very much similar to everything that we've been discussing also in, in South Asia and in Africa. And we're very happy to hear about that. Um, and those include, for instance, the issues of putting nature and justice at the center of decision-making and making sure that when at the international level, the COPs and, and, and all of these conferences come to decisions among governments that they actually take into account the benefit of nature and, and in the context of, in the cultural context of Latin America, the benefit of mother nature as well. Um, the second objective that we've been pursuing in, in, in the Resilience Hub and also in our strategy with in, in, in our engagement strategy with COP29 and COP30 is to uplift frontline voices to democratize governance, because we're very much aware that the climate agenda um, suffers from a monopoly of, of governments because they have the responsibility to develop and implement NDCs, but not necessarily to make those, those processes accessible and democratic and participatory and collaborative as they should be. Our third objective this next couple of years is to elevate locally led solutions. And of course, the experience that comes from locally led solutions and, and, and local communities in the implementation of, of climate action led by themselves. And the fourth, and, and, and Emil referred to that very much, and I think we share that objective as well, is to transform climate finance. So to make sure that climate finance actually reflects on the needs that are there from the local communities and the most vulnerable, and not just on gigantic projects made by 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 yeah by, by UN agencies accredited to the GCF and and, and believing that a two hundred fifty million dollar project is what the, the kind of impact that we're looking for in in terms of the needs of of communities and the most vulnerable. So we're very happy to see that all of those objectives, and 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 I'm sure we share those objectives and the the types of conversations that we, as managing partners of the Resilience Health, have, have been pushing forward, in in the global south and 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 in all three regions in Latin America, in Asia, and in Africa are very similar in trying to identify what these messages coming from the global south are, and in positioning these as lessons that are undervalued in the international arena. So very happy to hear about that. Big congratulations again to ICAT for everything that you've been organizing and, and the South Asia Resilience Hub. And thanks for the invitation to join you in this closing session. So back to you, Sakib. Thank you, Andres. And, and also maybe just a plug for everybody else that uh, as we have this South Asia Regional Hub, our sessions are all hosted online. So the, the recordings and, and key messages are tried to be uploaded as quickly as possible, but then a little bit more comprehensive discussion and a little bit more understanding and unpacking of the key messages we hope to be able to take to the physical COPs coming forward. But similarly, as, as both our colleagues at uh, South South North and Avina Foundation have mentioned, that there are other regional hubs. This is not the only one that's happening for a lot of the people that are working on these issues, as Emil and, and Andres have mentioned, that there are similar challenges coming forward. And I think uh, even in Adiba's overview and Emil just mentioned in, in the Africa hub as well, the heat issue has been something that has been correlated before as a climate impact that's likely to worsen and a resilience factor that we really need to be addressing. But I think in the last year or so, it's really become something that has come as a causality. And I think we're really now at the point being able to bring these sorts of evidence and case studies together, where we move from the correlation of climate and heat and actually be able to have that causality, evidence-driven, and policies that then need to be taken on that behalf. So again, I think picking on a little bit of what Andres had mentioned, 
traditionally, I, I believe a lot of the, the Latin American partners and organizations working would also have had similar challenges in developing that type of messaging when you've got that type of evidence and taking it to a relevant policymaker for an active action that needs to come through. And whether those are local governments, whether those are district governments, provincial, municipal, national governments being some of the more difficult ones to really engage with for local organizations. And again, that's something that we've been noticing has been a very bad trend in, in the South Asia region as well. So what would, in your experiences working with those types of actors, bringing them together in a platform, what would you give as sort of next steps in these new areas that we're now trying to causality link with the climate impacts and being able to take them to the right relevant uh, policymakers for an actual regulation, a policy, a framework, or just open their sort of thinking to be able to address this better for our communities. What would be some of the, the things that we should really try and foster among our partnerships and among our networks to be able to do that effectively? Andres? Thank you. Thank you, Saki. Thank you for that very difficult question. So um, I think that for those of us that have been working on climate for a long time, we tend to put ourselves in a box and it's, sometimes it's difficult to come out of that box. And I just had an event yesterday, a giant event, with 300 people. And I was explaining what a mitigation project is and what an adaptation project is. And sadly, when you go into those categories of things, you put way too much emphasis on climate mm -hmm. data and projections and historical data and different scenarios and so on. And, and you tend to, to come to the conclusion that those things are a requirement for us to act on climate for climate action and but and and of course when you talk to subnational stakeholders like like you said like municipalities or provincial governments and so on and you tell them nothing that you're doing is climate unless you have historical data on precipitations and 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 on heat and you have projections on different scenarios of the ipcc and so on they'll say fine then i won't do climate but then you also come to the realization when you look at action on the ground that there are several things that we're doing on mitigation and adaptation and that potentially don't fulfill those requirements of the climate box. And I feel that in, in the last years that has become much more evident as communities and subnational stakeholders have taken the commitment to also foster climate action, even if that information is not available or, or, or costs way too much. So recognizing that there are climate actions and, 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 and that many of the projects that we're undertaking on the ground related to access of water or even um, gender justice or um, access to, um, to, to, to many of, of the other resources that are being impacted by climate change are climate action. I think that that's, that's a big step forward. And, and also recognizing that this line that we tried to draw in the sand for a long time between climate action and development is not necessarily helpful in, in bringing all of the other stakeholders in, in what is needed worldwide is a big thing. The problem is that this line was very much drawn for finance for financial reasons. And and it, it will continue to be drawn from the sources of, of finance. But from the action on the ground, it's not really very helpful. So I think we need to find a way. And that's why we've been pushing very much this agenda of transformational finance. For finance also to realize that the, 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 the big obstacle to climate action is not necessarily lack of finance, but it's this over encumbering demand for climate information that is, is potentially the obstacle for, for, for climate action. I think that's, a, that's a, a realization and a reflection that we need to do with local stakeholders to say, this is not something that we need for climate action. I mean, climate action can be many things. We've been pushing very much, for instance, the Latin American network of recyclers. So people on the ground that do the recycling with their hands. And of course, you measure impacts in terms of the tons of waste that they've been recycling. And they, there, there is an impact on climate change, but it's very difficult to certify that impact, generate um, numbers and to have projections and so on. And, and you reach a point where capacities are not necessarily best directed at that. But that doesn't mean that it, it's not supporting climate change and that we shouldn't do it because of climate reasons. 
so this line this this line i think needs to be rethought of and and hopefully that's something that we can push in terms of our discourse Thank you, Andres. And, and I totally agree with, with the siloed and the lines approach. I think as a researcher, that I, we take a little bit of the blame on that because we, we like to segregate and be able to pinpoint that this is this and this is this minutely different, but it needs to be treated separately. And and I think there are, you're quite right. There is a need for places and times where you're able to do that just to make sure you're having that kind of impact and value added to the, the actions that you're taking. But then also not recognize that at some times the starting of that process or the ongoing of certain activities or so does not need to be segregated immediately. And I think going back to the, the previous point that I think you alluded to and uh, Emil mentioned as well, in terms of the financing, quite a lot of the areas that we're working particularly on when we're looking at biodiversity and climate um, projects are the distinctions of what counts as the climate funding that comes from that, because it might always be a, a sort of beholden to the donors as this comes from our bio biodiversity budget, this comes from our water budget, this comes from our agricultural support budget. So you need to be able to fit those parameters and those boxes. And then that doesn't really address the, the look of what is needed on the ground. Maybe that yes, it is a it is a tackle of biodiversity and water that you both need to do. But because the pot of funding only comes from one of those thematic areas, you're not able to address the other, and it becomes a a funding issue in terms of the activities that communities are doing. But for the communities, it's it's all inclusive. It's a holistic way of being able to deal with that and not having these siloed approaches and these siloed budgets where these funding comes from is also a constraint that we're we're trying to tackle. So hopefully that's something that we'll be able to take forward and crack either at this coming COP, ambitious as it might be, or in the upcoming COPs to come. Um, so with the COPs in mind, I will now hand on over to our colleague and friend, Shuti Vora. Shuti, would you like to introduce yourself and maybe give your remarks and hand back to me at the end of that. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening from Bangalore, India. I'm Shuti. I work with the Global Resilience Partnership and I lead learning in communities of practice. But here I am uh, wearing the hat of uh, coordinating the regional resilience hubs. And one of the things that uh, has been really close to my heart is getting together uh, what the regional virtual summit, regional hubs virtual summit that Adiba mentioned earlier uh, would look like. Um, this is on 7th and 8th of October. And everyone's welcome to join. The registration links are up already and it's virtual. So uh, we are working across time zones. We, we will have sessions. Uh, across South Asia, Af Africa, and Latin America time zones, which are amenable to global time zones and, and sessions that, that are relevant to these regions. Having said that, um, one of our, our I, I would like to step back a little bit and, and maybe... Uh, maybe take you through why we had the Regional Resilience Hub in, in the first place. Uh, it was uh, Professor Salimul Haq who put out a call to take the COP to, COP to the people. And uh, the Resilience Hub responded to that. GRP as a managing partner responded to that with the Regional Resilience Hub uh, hubs coming into existence. So we provide essentially provide a platform uh, to our colleagues from the partnership. So. Um, ICAD, Avina, SDI, uh, SSN, these are all close partners. Sorry for all these acronyms, but uh, that's how our world goes. And hopefully you know all of them. Uh, they can be quite a mouthful, so I shall not attempt to uh, <laughs> elaborate on these. But anyway, so um, we do have three regional hubs this year. Uh, we have South Asia, which is uh, which which is the sessions that we are kind of working on currently, and at the closing session of, uh, we have Africa and Latin America, um, and uh, the the objective of setting up these uh, regional resilience hubs has been as much to amplify and surface. Uh, the regional priorities as much as it is for cross-learning and sharing of messages across this, these regions, because there's a lot, like, like was already discussed, there's a lot of similarities in terms of uh, what we are experiencing, uh, the kind of uh, 
climate impacts that we experience, but also the historical trajectories and geopolitics that we have experienced. As much as we may think ours is a unique context, we do share a lot of history and share a lot of uh, a lot of experiences with uh, others in the majority world. So, with that intention, we uh, we have wanted to create the space for uh, cross learning, and we are. Uh, at the end of it all, I mean, as 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 the as the core objective, we want to create an inspirational movement towards democratization of um, of policy processes and governance processes towards climate biodiversity uh, and um, broadly development impacts as well. So, uh, yeah, having said that, I think. Uh, so two hats, like I said, so Resilience Hub, GRP is a managing partner for the Resilience Hub. And for GRP itself, uh, I'm here as a representative of GRP. And for us, the partnership is important and, and putting the partner at the center of uh, what we do is extremely important. So uh, giving this platform or sharing this platform and creating this platform for um, adaptation and resilience actors, especially from... Uh, from the majority world and especially from uh, the grassroots actually um, and representatives of the grassroots if not the grassroots um, is has been an extremely important exercise for us we we have wanted to stay you know remain authentic to the idea of uh, setting up these platforms and ensuring that they they uh, they move in ways that unfold and unravel uh, the priorities that we need to take towards COP and link not just like Emil and Andres have mentioned, not just COP and, and priorities around finance and, um, and policy, not just at COP, the climate COP, but also at the biodiversity COP, linking those two very strongly. Um, I shall stop there uh, and uh, shall, I'm happy to answer questions if any. Thank you. Thank you, Shuti. Um, and also, thank you again for reminding us that this is a, an initiative that we started off, I believe, in COP26 was the first one we ran Indeed. it. Indeed. And, and the first time we ran it, we tried to do it very ambitiously as live during the COPs, having it run exactly. while the, the COP weeks were happening, which ended up with being quite difficult with all the different teams that were able to manage and run and sessions that were happening, but then also being able to give a prominent space in the venue of where all these different regions are coming in through. And I think then we shifted into this pre-COP phase where we're able to hold on to that momentum. Okay. And, and I hope that that's something that has been, in our opinion, has been very, very effective, but also for all our partners that are hosting the various hubs. I hope that that's been something that's fruitful in being able to have these discussions, have a little bit of the key messages, be a bit distilled, be a little bit more a bit on target on the different negotiation tracks that happen at the COPs and then being able to send these messages to the relevant stakeholders when they're going into their negotiations, when they're going into different thematic sessions or their bilateral meetings. And I, I hope that that's something that this year, again, we're able to really come back together after the virtual summit where we're synthesizing from all the different hubs and their activities, really being able to have that sort of evidence case of what are the messages from communities and partners that are working in, in the different regions that we're all hosting the hubs from. And then and being able to network that at the at the conventions, not just at the climate, but also at the convention of biodiversity, if many of our colleagues are going there. So I'd, I'd, again, just maybe picking up on your side on that front, we realize GRP and, and on a number of our partners are doing a number of activities. You alluded to a couple of the ones that are upcoming. What would be the best way for us to try and take this community of practice to through those activities? What are some of the things that they should look out for? If you have any links, please do feel free to put them on the chat. We'll share them on the on the comments on the social medias as well. Great. Thank you so much. I don't have links at hand. I haven't. I should have come ready with them, but uh, I haven't. Uh, but please feel free to Google us and uh, feel free to Google uh, COP Resilience Hub, which should give you uh, details to the events, not just the virtual event, but also the New York Climate Week, which uh, due to time zone constraints is happening on Eastern Standard Time, Eastern Time, Eastern Coast Time, maybe, uh, but uh, which doesn't work very well for South Asia, seven, six and a half, seven hours of time difference from India and so on, if you can imagine, eastwards. So uh, yeah, catch the recordings for that. Uh, in terms of uh, COP itself and uh, the processes that you were talking about, uh, Sakib, it I have one reflection I think that's very important. I think uh, 
we do talk about taking a lot of these messages uh, back to people. We also talk about bringing in their messages. Uh, I think it's, I think the the key to this this process of how do we bring them along lies in how do we create this into a process rather than a series of events. If we treat them as a series of events, and which is why this year, uh, I should have mentioned this before, but thank you for asking this question. I can plug this in now. But this year, we this in fact the next this year and the next we the resilience hub like many other uh, other policy processes across climate biodiversity has taken a uh, an on the road approach. So we are basically having an eye towards COP30. Uh, that's our goal. So we we don't stop with COP29 in terms of our uh, our engagement, whether it's synthesizing uh, our learnings, uh, putting them out in different uh, different media. Uh, when I say media, I mean a wide variety of mediums that we that we put them out in, or through bilateral conversations or advocacy or so on, or and also using this this resilience hub as a continuous platform for learning and and continuous platform for uh shared learning that we that we build across these regions as well so that's been a strong reflection through uh running this process this year how do we how do we ensure we uh create a continuous learning mechanism across uh the, these regions is is uh something that has stayed with me Thank you. I, I would, again, plug some of our online activities that happen that focus a lot on the various different learnings and lessons and evidence that people come through. So the, the annual Gobeshana conference that we host online, uh, our partners at IID that host the uh, community-based adaptation conferences, which will be in their 18th series next year, I believe. Um, and again, the resilience hub activities that happen the regional hubs here, but the physical ones. So there are a number of play touch points that I think because we're working across vast regions and vast different um, networks and, and thematic areas that people should really look out for. And as Suchi mentioned, uh, please do feel free to Google for the websites and look at the uh, New York Climate Summit Week, I believe this will be uh, in next week. And um, please do look out for those links. And if you're able to join online for them, please do join those. If there are any key messages from there that also filters back for us in this process. And, and I take your point on that. I think Suchi was a very, very good way of uh, sort of succinctly letting us know that it's not a one-off event that we're trying to have and hope that it creates that sort of impact and that sort of collaboration, but it's a, it's a movement building. It's a start of a process. And what are really some of the ways that we can really capitalize on that? And again, I plug this series of the regional hubs that we've been doing with our partners as the start of that movement. I think we have quite a good bit of a following. As I mentioned, a number of people, even if small percentages and fractions of people that have been recurrent session organizers over the number of years or participants through the number of years as well as throughout this week. So again, I think we've started that very crucial element of getting the word out, getting people to look into this space, getting people to know some of the partners and know who to look out for and what to Google. And I think it's it's also a little bit of an onus on us on how we make this into a process and institutional building, as opposed to just something that we are also waiting for at the end of the year for an event to happen. And then this is a week that we do so. So I think again, that the onus on that is us as a partnership to also look into how we do this as a procedure and how how we're really being able to resource these things so it's a conversation that continues and and again bringing back into the the tag words that we use the community of practice because that's really what we're trying to sort of embody here with these uh, different stakeholders and actors coming through these different lessons that we're coming through is bringing people together so that they're really able to work as a community together practicing um, climate actions together on their own with that, I'm very, very grateful and thankful for all of you for all your time, for joining us from all the different uh, time zones that you're in, for giving us your insightful feedbacks and what to look forward to. Um, before I hand back to Adiba for the, the final closing of the week, I'd like to give one more round of applause to all our partners, all our co-hosts, our session organizers, and also to my team who've been working tirelessly, not just on the session hours, but the weeks and nights beforehand that it takes to do so. Many of you will see them on the background, in the, in the virtual background in there, but thank you all for all of them working again on a weekend as well for them. So thank you all. And I'll hand back to Adi Adiba. Thank you, Adiba. Thank you, Sakib. Thank you so much for, and all the panelists actually for making the time. I know it's going to be your weekend soon, actually. But then again, thank you. Thank you so much. We have a, a last thing that we need to do is we will be taking a photo. So I would like to uh, request everyone to turn on their camera so that we can take a screenshot.
Und dann? Dann. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay.